Hello, my name's Craig Barton, and welcome to a video talking about the pedagogy behind diagnostic questions, and also when to use diagnostic questions both in and outside of the classroom. Now I've actually written an article about this that's available on the website, and I'm just gonna talk through this um, in this video. So if you visit diagnosticquestions.com and you go to the about and click on what are diagnostic questions, then you get all the information hopefully that you need. So when I first came up with the idea for the website, it was because um, I wanted a way to accurately and quickly assess the understanding of my students in my class in real time. Because often in the past I'd gone all the way through a lesson, I'd designed a really nice activity and it got to the end of it and I had no real way of knowing what the students had taken out of it. And likewise, I might be halfway through a lesson and some students are doing well, some students seem to be struggling, and I didn't have that accurate information to hand that told me exactly where the students were going wrong. And that's where diagnostic questions can really come into play. So if we look at the most basic of, of examples, um, here's a question, there are four possible answers, uh, one of which is right, three of which are wrong, but crucially, each of the wrong answers reveals a key misconception that that student may have. So hopefully if my maths is right, um, B is the correct answer, but A reveals a very interesting misconception. Uh, perhaps the students here think to work out the area of a rectangle, you add the two dimensions together instead of multiplying them together. Uh, likewise with C, that's a different type of misconception. Here perhaps students are muddling up the concept of area with perimeter and thinking that you need to add the four sides together instead of simply multiplying the base by the perpendicular height. And finally, D is another interesting one. Possibly here students selecting this may have got so obsessed with working out the air of a triangle and remembering to halve it that they're halving absolutely everything. So they're doing 10 times seven and then halving the answer to get 35. So the idea is that you would ask this question to your students and there's numerous ways of doing that that we'll talk about um, in a minute or so. And you would learn something immediately from the answers that they gave. Um, now, if we just uh, keep going here, um, when I, before the website was um, around, I simply used to ask this question in the classroom, project it up on the board, and my students would have A, B, C, D cards, so they could simply hold up their answer. And if I didn't have those, then I would ask them to show it with their fingers. So one finger for A, uh, two fingers for B, three fingers, three fingers for C, and four fingers for D. Um, but now, of course, with the technology of the website, I don't need the students to do that. They can answer this question on their mobile phones, their tablets, um, or on their laptop, either in the classroom or as part of a homework activity. And more than that as well, when they answer the question, they're prompted to give a reason. So for example, say you're a student who goes for C, um, and they're asked why C, why 34? They could say uh, 10 plus 10 plus seven plus seven equals 34, and submit that answer. And uh, then I'm told immediately why the student thinks what they think. But it's more important than that. The students are immediately told that they got that question wrong, but that's useless unless they have a bit of extra information about why they're wrong and what the right answer is. So as you saw there, they can benefit from seeing explanations given by students from all around the world who's got, who have got this question right. So as they scroll through, they can keep going until they find one that makes sense to them. And when they find it, they can like it, and that'll be stored on their records as one of their favorited explanations. So hopefully students can be learning uh, from this as much as teachers are learning. Uh, so as I say, in my ideal world, um, I use this with mobile phones, with tablets and laptops, but there's still times when that's not appropriate. So I still go back to the old fashioned way of doing this, project it up on the board and get students to vote with their A, B, C, D cards um, or vote with their fingers one, two, three and four. And um, then you get the question of when, when to actually use these in the classroom. Now the most common ways to possibly use them is a starter activity, but a very specific starter, and that's to assess baseline knowledge. So for example, um, imagine I was about to go into depth on trigonometric ratios, sine, tan, and cos. Now before I did all the teaching of that, I need to make sure students could um, accurately label um, the sides of right angle triangles. So I might ask them this question, because if you can't get this question right, there's absolutely no point me trying to impart new knowledge on them about the trigonometric ratios, because they don't have that foundation, that baseline level of knowledge. So a diagnostic question at the start of the lesson to assess baseline knowledge is an ideal way to use this. Uh, likewise, the middle of the lesson is, is another interesting one. So um, imagine, for example, that I've been uh, teaching a lesson on different shapes of graphs and I've, I've done an introduction and then I've set the kids off on a, on a task and they're all working away. 
and perhaps I haven't spoken for 15, 20 minutes, something like that. Now that's great, but I still need to get a snapshot of the level of understanding um, of the students in my class. So maybe I'll stop the whole class just for a few seconds and I'll project this question up on the board just to see what the level of understanding is of the class. And if I find that some students are struggling, perhaps I can pair them up with other students. And um, if I find that everybody's having a bit of a nightmare with it, then it's time to stop doing the task that we're doing and, and go back to basics, come back to the board and let me do some teaching. So it just gives me that information that I need and allows me to intervene. Um, and another classic way to do it is at the end of the lesson. And this is your standard plenary, um, but it, it, it leaves you with such good information that prepares you for the next series of lessons. So for example, imagine you've taught a lesson on probability and it's been quite a complex lesson on probability and you've no idea what your students know or what they don't know until you take the books in. Well, here's a way of getting a very quick snapshot of that. Just ask them a, a diagnostic question at the end. Either, again, get them to do it with the technology or just get them to do it showing you the fingers or holding up the cards or whatever. And you'll get a really deep understanding of what your students know and what they don't know. Um, but of course, it's not just in the classroom. Using diagnostic questions at home is now a fundamental part of our school's homework uh, regime. We set each of our classes from year seven to six form a diagnostic question quiz every week. Uh, we create these from the freely available questions on the website. Uh, we set them on a Monday, they've got to be in for a Thursday. And students answer these, again, on mobile phones, perhaps on the bus, perhaps in front of the telly, um, or they do them on their tablets or their laptops, wherever. We don't mind, we just want them to be answering it and crucially giving their explanations for their answers. Now, there's loads of videos in this series about how you can create uh, quizzes um, out of the questions, all completely for free, um, or you can use a, some of the hundreds of freely made um, quizzes that are available on the website to set to your to set your classes. If you want to know how to do that, just watch some of the videos in this series. Um, the key thing pedagogically is, is responding to students' answers. Um, and again, I just want to just spend a, a minute or so just chatting about this because there's, there's lots of different scenarios that can happen. Uh, firstly, everybody could get the question right. Um, now, if that happens, and this is quite difficult as a teacher, um, you've, you've got to really move on because uh, I've been there myself many a time. I've, I've come up with what I thought was a really nice lesson, perhaps on, fra on simplifying fractions. And then I ask a question at the start and everybody gets it right, well, there's not much point me carrying on doing my activity because how are the students going to make sufficient progress there when they've already demonstrated that they know how to do the skill that I'm trying to teach them? So it's quite difficult as a teacher to do that, but you've got evidence there from the answers to the diagnostic questions and probe them for their explanation. But if they've got it right, then it's, it's time to move on to a different activity. But that doesn't al always happen. Uh, sometimes um, most could get the question right, but a few could get the question wrong. And if that's the case, then again, it's completely up to you as a teacher, but you've got valuable insight into the fact that a couple of your students have got the question wrong. Um, hopefully, perhaps they will benefit from listening to the students who've got it right, explain it. Um, perhaps you could pair them up with students who've got it right, or maybe you could set the uh, rest of the class on with a, an activity and you simply take the couple of kids who've got it wrong round the table to the front and do a bit of intervention teaching, armed with that extra knowledge that you've got of where they've gone wrong, given from their um, response and explanation to the diagnostic question. And then there are other scenarios here. There's a mixture of responses. Some get it right, some get it wrong. Well, here again, you can buddy them up um, if you want. And there's absolutely nothing wrong with that. Or you can do um, intervention. Or hopefully, if the kids are answering these using the technology, then hopefully they're resolving their own misconceptions because they're benefiting from reading correct explanations given by students from all around the world. This is quite an interesting one as well. Most get the question right, uh, most get the question wrong, but a few get the question uh, correct. And one of my favourite things to do here is, and this depends on the on the class. I don't, I won't do this with all my classes. Is to appoint a few experts or leaders. Um, and they're the kids who've demonstrated, demonstrated to me that they've got it right and I'm happy with their level of understanding. So I, I put one of those um, on each table and I put them in charge of that table, crucially in charge of explaining to the students how to answer those particular questions. And I say to them, in five minutes time, I'm gonna put another diagnostic question up on the board and you're responsible for the success of your table. So you better try and explain to them exactly why they get the question right in this particular way and get that depth of understanding. Really, really challenging. And also, this happens a lot. All the, all the, everybody gets the question wrong. And if that's the case, then at least you know about it. Hopefully you've got a bit of extra information from their answers why they've got it wrong. And it might be time to go back to the drawing board and teach the topic again, but maybe in a slightly different way. What makes a good diagnostic question? Well, I have a few golden rules. Got to be answered in no more than 30 seconds. If, you, if students are 
spending too much time thinking about the answers, it's hard to pinpoint where that misconception lies. Likewise, not multi-step questions, because then if they're having to do two or three leaps of, of, of understanding to get to the answer, if they go wrong on any one of those, there's too many different combinations there, and I need to pinpoint where that misconception is. I need to be able to learn something from each incorrect answer. I don't really want redundant answers there. And it shouldn't be possible to arrive at the correct answer while still having key misconceptions. So there's lots of different examples here um, on the website that show you examples of questions that I think aren't that great. And I've written them all, so don't think I'm having a go at someone. And uh, improvements of those questions. So again, I'll just leave you to read those um, in your own time. But the final thing I just want to, want to pick up on is the benefits of teachers and students creating these questions. Teachers creating questions has been one of the single biggest things that's, that's improved our department and specifically the professional development that happens in, in, in our department. I've always said that joint planning lessons together with other teachers is a recipe for disaster because everybody teaches in their own different style. And God, I remember trying to plan a PowerPoint out with somebody on there. I think it was simultaneous equations. We spent half the time arguing over the font and the animations instead of thinking about the pedagogy and the, and the mathematical understanding. Planning questions together is fantastic because it allows you to identify misconceptions, talk about shared experiences, and it's not technology dependent or teacher style dependent. A good question is a good question for everybody. So I strongly advise you to start writing some questions together and then upload them up to this website. But students writing questions is a phenomenal way of increasing their level of understanding. Um, we've all got those child geniuses in our class who get everything right all the time. And it's, sometimes it's hard to know how to stretch and challenge them. Well, one thing that never fails is to ask them to write a diagnostic question on the subject that you're doing and get them to explain each of their wrong answers. So there's some examples from some of my year 11 classes there. So that's um, a little overview of the pedagogy behind diagnostic questions. And what I've tried to do with the website is to take a simple idea that I've been using in the classroom for years and hopefully enhance it, use technology, but in an appropriate way and allow you to learn so much about your students' levels of understanding and the misconceptions they have and allow the students themselves to be able to resolve their own misconceptions. It's all completely for free. And if you want to know some of the features that you can do on the website, simply click on the about and go to the how to and you'll see simple video guides on each of those. Hope that was useful. Take care and bye for now.